When compared to Fallout 3, it seems the developers of New Vegas really wanted to make the idea of an unarmed build fairly viable. As anyone who has ever made an unarmed build will tell you, weapons like the Power Fist and Ballistic Fist can be absurdly powerful if you plan your build around them. But that said, they aren't the only unarmed weapons. In fact, chances are, the first unarmed weapons you'll come across will be either the Boxing Gloves or the Boxing Tape. Now while they are incredibly weak weapons in terms of damage, their potential lies in their bonus effect that allows them to inflict fatigue damage that will knock out a target and leave them defenceless for a time. Out of these two weapons, the Boxing Gloves do more fatigue damage and therefore can be seen as the better alternative to the Boxing Tape. The only advantages of using the tape are a slightly higher damage output and better durability. So with all that information in mind, today we aim to find out, can you beat Fallout New Vegas with only Boxing Tape? When I start making the character, I name him Titanium Tiger, which should really give you some clear indication of what I'm going to do as soon as I'm let loose in the Mojave. My special stats are about what you'd expect from an armed build, just to focus on strength and endurance and then the rest of the points are sprinkled over intelligence and luck for good measure. As for my tag skills, I took Unarmed, Medicine and Speech. Speech mainly just because right from the moment I thought about doing this challenge, I thought it'd be fun to try and fight the Legate one on one. And finally for my traits, I chose Heavy Handed because if the tape is as bad as I think it is, I will need all the extra damage that I can get. And with that in mind, I also took the skill trait, because in my opinion, losing out in 10% experience isn't all that bad for the added benefits of some extra skill points. As usual, I get as many stim packs off of Doc Mitchell as I can before leaving, and as soon as I'm outside, I head straight over to Chet as he sometimes sells boxing tape. Seems this time, however, I was out of luck as he only had boxing gloves for sale. No matter, if you leave Good Springs as if you were heading towards Prim, you can stop off inside the Gene Sky Diving Building, where there's a guaranteed set of boxing tape inside one of the lockers. And even better, you don't even have to have any skill points in lockpicking as there's a key for the locker on the desk as soon as you go in. The boxing tape aren't in the best condition right now, in fact they're rather close to breaking. Now while I could use some of the weapon repair kits I have thanks to owning the Game of the Year version of New Vegas, or even the repair kit in Victor's Shack in Good Springs, I wanted to save them just in case I find myself in a sticky situation later on. That said, I did test them out on a few nearby powder gangers, and to my surprise, I was able to take them both out with a single punch each. I even checked the difficulty just to be sure it was still a normal, which it was. I'm guessing this is just because I'm still at the very beginning of the game? I can only imagine it'll begin to become less effective as I face tougher enemies with more health and better weapons. Now I was off towards Hidden Valley to find the Brotherhood. My initial plan was if I couldn't deal a lot of damage, I may as well make sure I can take as much as humanly possible before dying. On the way, I fought more powder gangers, and due to these ones being a little tougher than those I fought before, I was actually able to make use of the fatigue damage and knock one of them out. He then watched in horror as I ever so slowly wheeled away on him until he finally stopped making noises. The knockout effect seems to be pretty great in one-on-one -on -one encounters, but I'm not sure how good it'll be if I'm being attacked by multiple enemies at once, however. I did have some fun bobbing and weaving while fighting the bark scorpions outside of the bunker. They also seem to have a very small amount of fatigue as it only took about 2 or 3 punches to knock them down, and from there they were easy pickings, just so long as I didn't get surrounded by all of their friends. As for the bunker itself, I obviously lack the ability to pick the very hard lock on the door right now, so that's not going to work. I could technically go get Veronica, but she got plenty of use last week, so I think we'll leave her be for now. Speaking of last week's video however, I am heading back to that crater near Black Mountain, so I can strip the corpses of the Brotherhood of Steel member for their power armor, as well as their mission orders, which I can in fact use to gain quick access to the bunker. This is something that I actually wasn't aware of until recently, so that's good to know. The downside to this, however, is that I still get outfitted with the Slave Collar and therefore have to go and get rid of the NCR Ranger like I would have if I'd just shown up here later in the story. When I meet up with said Ranger, I thought I would have the ability to persuade him to leave, but uh, that wasn't the case this time. So instead, it was time for me to deal with him the long way. But before that, of course, Malcolm Holmes decided to drop in for a surprise visit to ruin my plan of getting a sneak attack. While Dobson here can hurt me pretty badly this early in the game, he seems to have a rather low fatigue level, and as such I'm able to knock him down rather easily. The only issue here is the fact of exactly how many hits this would take to kill him. Well, to give you all some sort of idea of how many punches were thrown, I was here for nearly 4 straight minutes just giving him the old 1-2. This went on for so long that by the time I was finished my tape was about as close to being broken as it could without actually breaking. Once I was finished however, I headed back to the bunker to inform them of a job well done and from there got to work trying to get my power armor train as fast as humanly possible. Seeing how I already found one of the patrols, all I would need to do is find the last two, one which is at the Repcom building on the way to Camp McCarran, and then the others are just outside of Nellis by the rumors, so at least I'm heading that way. Before I went gallivanting across the Mojave however, I began making my way to the Mojave outpost to get my tape fully repaired by Major Knight. I thought maybe I had enough durability left that I could save Deputy Beagle and Prim, but on the way there I decided to beat up one of the local geckos and almost immediately the tape broke in my hands. Nothing really out of the ordinary happened while I jogged towards the outpost unable to defend myself. Once there, I got the tape all fixed up and was now ready to suffer my way through the rest of the challenge. I travelled back to Hidden Valley and began making my way to the Repcon headquarters by way of Black Mountain. 
I was lucky enough to mostly avoid a confrontation with the super mutants for the time being. Didn't really like the idea of trying to punch something to death that is furiously swinging a piece of concrete at me. Inside the Repcon building and I realised I lacked the ability to quickly make my way to the upper levels so would instead have to sit through the tour. I would like to point out that I completely forgot that you can just kill the Mr. Handy and get the key that way. Once I did gain access to the upper levels, finding the Brotherhood soldiers didn't take too long. I also got to engage in the best dialogue exchange in video game history. Third floor access is free Thank you, sir. With that out of the way, I began the long walk to Nellis. On the way there, I did bump into those two golden geckos from the Kowalski run. This time, however, there was no mercy to be had and they were dealt with swiftly. I also murdered George, as per usual. I mean, there's really no reason not to. It's basically free money at the end of the day. Rather than searching for the Brotherhood soldiers during an artillery strike, I thought it would make more sense that I actually meet with the Boomers now, as I do actually plan on siding with Mr. House this time, so I would need to meet the Boomers anyway. Well, after just about surviving the bombardment, I meet up with Pearl, and once I'm done, I immediately leave and grab the last of the items I needed from the Brotherhood soldiers and report it back to Harden, as siding with him is the quickest way to get the power armor training from what I can remember. Well, I'm not exactly finished yet, as to become a full-fledged member I have to do one tiny last favour, and that is to completely decimate and destroy any and all individuals involved with the Van Graffs. Now, while I'm sure all of you would like nothing more than to watch me smash my head against the wall while I try to fight my way through multiple people in high quality armour with plasma weapons, I instead decided this is one of those rare occasions where I shall use my brain box. I offered my services to work as a guard for the Van Graffs, and then when this totally not suspicious gentleman approaches, I just make sure to let him in without searching him for weapons, and this causes everyone inside to be sent to the next dimension. The only exception being Simon. But that's alright, because this gives me an excuse to get some punching in before I head back to the Brotherhood for my membership card, and therefore my right to dress up like a robot. Now, Titanium Tiger could finally live up to his oddly specific name. With that in mind, I decided to head back to Prim and make good on rescuing Deputy Beagle. I didn't really need to do this, but I figured it would be easy experience. Turns out I couldn't be more right, as 9mm pistols tend not to really do a whole lot against a literal steel suit. That being said, they also didn't seem to have a whole lot of health either, as I was able to take most of them down in a few punches, including the convict leader. This is also where I noticed that unarmed attacks seem to have a pretty great chance at disarming your opponents. That's actually completely new information to me. Needless to say, knowing that made me a little more confident in my abilities going forward. After I got Beagle out of his pickle, I promoted Slim to Sheriff and with that got enough experience to level up and max out my unarmed skill already. With Prim safe once more, I began heading towards Nipton. As is tradition at this point, I wanted to fight Vaultblaze and his men to gauge my strength, as well as kill Oliver Swanick for good luck or something. On the way, I did get harassed by some ants who just really wanted to die today, so I granted them their wish like the magical metal genie that I am. As I mentioned, I planned to kill Oliver Swanick, and just to put this out there, he may have been the weakest enemy I've fought so far. He kinda just crumpled like all of his bones turned into jelly. For what it's worth, I also went inside and killed boxcars. Seems to me he may be faking his injuries as he seems to be standing up and using his legs just fine while I punch him to death. Now for the fight with Volpes and his legion. I was going into this fight full well expecting to have to use a bunch of healing items and drugs just to come out on top. Turns out, however, I completely forgot just how good power armor really is in New Vegas. The legion may as well have been using BB guns for all I know as that's about as much damage as they were doing. Volpes himself was super disappointing. I started with a few cross punches that immediately staggered and crippled him, as well as continuing to knock the ripper out of his hand, which led to more free hits while he scrambled to pick it back up. After a few uppercuts, Volpes was out for the count and all that was left was a few dogs as well as the Legion recruits. All but one of them went down without much issue. However, the last recruit seemed to have some sort of invisible machete and was putting up a substantially better fight than Volpes was. Even after I disarmed his invisible weapon, he then immediately went and grabbed Volpes' ripper and tried to kill me that way. Granted, his attempt failed, but I admired the dedication. Since I am a good citizen, I helped the majority of the powder gangers down off their crosses. From there, I then went back to the Mojave Outpost to tell Ranger Ghost about Nipton for some free experience. This, however, turned out to be a big mistake on my part, as I completely forgot to unequip my power armor, and as such, all of the NCR that were outside the outpost building began trying to kill me. I ended up having to kill Sergeant Kilborn and Ranger Ghost, which was a shame. I was smart enough to take it off before entering the main building though, and since I was there, I decided to have Major Knight repair my equipment, even though it wasn't all that badly damaged. After all this was done, I made my way to Novak as I wanted to learn the special unarmed technique from Ranger Andy, as it can knock people off their feet, and that sounded like something that would come in incredibly useful during fights where I'm heavily outnumbered. Well, once I meet up with Andy, I Mega Man him. For anyone who doesn't know what that means, basically I absorb his move and then kill him so that only I may use it. Seeing how I'm in the area, I decide to head up the road to Helios 1 and get the panel parts that I would need to help the boomers in their quest. There was obviously no way in hell they were going to let me walk in the front door, no questions asked, so this very quickly became a bloodbath for the NCR stationed there. 
You could say this is me getting revenge for the Brotherhood at the previous Battle of Helios 1, but considering that I'll be killing all of them as well rather soon for Mr. House, I don't think they would want to be associated with me. Dealing with everyone at Helios 1 was rather trivial. They aren't all that tough, and once you get out to the back where all the parts are that I need, there are plenty of beds for me to rest in between fights, so I don't even have to use many healing supplies either. Once everyone was out for the count and the parts were collected, I returned to Nellis and got to work repairing the dishes as well as going 10 rounds with all the ants that needed clearing out. I won't waste your time on the ants as they were no more difficult than the ones I killed outside of Nipton. Once that was over with, I sat through the Boomer's History lesson for some more good boy points, and then I had planned to help the patients in the doctor's office, but lacked the skill to do so. So instead, I left and began making my way to the strip to confront Benny. Well, I say that, but first off, I stopped into Gamor to start a fight with the Omerdas. See, while I am siding with House this time, I really can't be bothered to do his quest to investigate the Omerdas, and as I found out from last week's video, you can just kill the Omerdas and not suffer any lasting consequences, so that's nice. Now, I was on my way to the tops with the exact same strategy in mind. I would like to point out that at some stage I did take the bloody mess perk, and as a result, I have been punching people's limbs off for a while now. That's honestly not really important in the grand scheme of things, but I just thought some of you would like to know that before Benny exploded all of a sudden. With the chip in hand, I really should have gone straight back to house, but I don't like the idea of going two for three on the casinos. So I ended up also ripping everyone inside the white gloves to shreds as well. I would also need one of their suits for something in a bit. Anyway, once the gloves hung up their gloves, I finally made my way into the Lucky 38 and started getting the ball rolling on the story. And by that, I mean the demonstration. Thanks to this, however, I was able to level up and put enough points into medicine that could go back and heal the last of the boomers, and therefore get their final quest, and could be done with them now ahead of schedule. I also thought it made the most sense to do this now, as I had to go to the fort anyway to upgrade the Securitrons for Mr. House, and seeing how the bomber is literally on the way, I could kill two birds with one stone. Or in my case, two baby deathclaws. Yeah, on my journey south, I had planned to go to the Brotherhood of Steel's hidden cache, but I forgot that it is literally in Deathclaw Town and rather quickly gave up on that idea after one of the Deathclaws followed me inside and essentially cornered me. In my defence, like I said, I was able to kill a few of the young ones, but the fully grown Deathclaws were just effortlessly ripping through my power armour, and as such, I decided to take a different path to my destination. I fast travelled back to the Repcon building and made my way to the 188 trading post and met up with Veronica. This right here is why I got that suit from the White Gloves. If you give it to Veronica, she will teach you a scribe counter-punching technique, which I'm sure will come in useful when I have to fight Legion soldiers on the dam during the endgame. Anyway, enough about that, time for the crap, man. This time I was ready to fight them, and to my surprise, it went rather well. I was easily able to cripple them, and in one's case, I scared it off and ran after him and chased him down. Oh, now I know what Kowalski and Burke must feel like. With the crabs now caked, it was time to raise the bomber. And now to chalk up another thing I don't know about this game, wearing a power armor helmet seems to give you more oxygen when underwater. I mean, it makes sense, but it's honestly just something I never knew. Enough gushing about this game though, I had a family of big horners to murder. Well, I mean, I didn't really have to do this, but hey, free experience and meat for everyone, so I can't complain. Regardless, after that I arrive at Cottonwood Cove and get my tape taken away from me. I don't know how I can't easily find a way to hide sports tape on my person, or better yet, why Caesar classifies him as a weapon, but whatever. After I get the platinum chip back off of Baldy, I talk to Lucius and made him teach me another unarmed technique. Unlike Ranger Andy, however, I can't kill him afterwards as I still don't have my tape back. Underneath the fort and I install the upgrades to the Securitrons with zero problems. The Protectrons and turrets down here all go down within a few punches. I was honestly ready to just run past them as I thought the tape would do zero damage to them, but it turns out it's only the fatigue damage they ignore, so that's a relief. With the Securitrons now ready to unleash hell on many a gambler as well as the boomers in our pocket, it was time for me to go and betray the Brotherhood like I knew I would have to. For what it's worth, I did try to kill them all single-handedly. I thought it was going to be a cakewalk considering how easy it was for me to take down Paladin Ramos, but truth be told, even with my power armor and as many healing supplies as I could buy from people like Doc Mitchell in the New Vegas clinic, I never stood a chance against the entirety of the Brotherhood. The main issue was the Goss rivals that just ripped right through me no matter what. Plus, even when I did manage to knock some of them out, they seemed to be regenerating health faster than I could do damage, especially while having to focus on anyone else who was attacking me. So, after a few failed attempts, I decided to just do things the old-fashioned way and stole the key cards and initiated the self-destruct sequence instead. The strangest part about this was that despite the fact I was now vilified and that the game had them all marked as enemies, the members of the Brotherhood were all just walking around like nothing was happening, the only exception being Paladin Ramos. Regardless, once I was out, I reported my genocide back to House, who was overjoyed at all the murder. Speaking of murder, I was honestly planning to save Kimball, but according to House, the NCR wouldn't let me near him. Almost as if my reputation with them was low, but I'm pretty sure it was only at neutral, but maybe that's low enough, I'm honestly not sure. Not that it matters anyway, as it just moves me on to the next objective, having to go to the substation and do the usual situation there. On the way there, however, things got a bit more interesting than usual when I got ambushed by some Legion assassins. This was by far the longest fight yet, mainly because I couldn't hurt them and they couldn't really hurt me either, so it was a war of attrition in its purest form. 
The only reason this battle didn't end up taking close to 20 minutes is thanks to the interference of some nearby fire ants who absolutely roasted some of the Legion soldiers to a crisp. The thing is however, while the ants were helping me, I turned my focus to them as I realised that once the Legion were dead there was nothing stopping them from digesting my face, and just as I was shifting my focus some nearby traders also decided they wanted in on some of the action and came in and mopped up the last of the Legion and the ants. Well that was certainly unexpected. But honestly, I'm not complaining because when all's said and done, I levelled up and was finally able to gain access to what is no doubt the best perk for this run, the Piercing Strike perk. Essentially, it just lets my unarmed attacks ignore a decent amount of an enemy's armour resistances. Honestly, if I had this before I had to fight the Brotherhood, it's fairly likely I would have been able to brute force my way through them eventually. I guess we'll never know. Well, that is unless I make a short follow-up video of me trying to do that, but we'll see. Seeing how the Legion are now out of the way, I make sure to unequip my power armor so I can just mosey on into the substation and activate what I've got to activate and then quickly make it back to Mr. House before the NCR realizes anything is up. With everything ready, it was now time for the Battle of Hoover Dam. I actually made sure to fight and kill every single enemy on the dam that I could find, for no reason other than sheer bloodlust and also because I wanted to test out the piercing strike perk. All you need to know is it did indeed speed up fights by a lot, especially with very light armored enemies. Well, I say light armoured enemies, but even the NCR heavy troops went down rather anticlimactically. After leaving the offices, the upgraded Securitrons pretty much obliterated any Legion before I could even make it to them, so all that was left for me to worry about was the Legate's camp. Some of the Legion soldiers with ballistic fists may have proven dangerous if I hadn't gotten the Scribe counter from Veronica, so thanks for that. Sorry about your family though. Now, as I mentioned at the very beginning, I had maxed out my speech so that I could fight the Legate one on one, and that is exactly what I did. It was a very gruelling fight. For every punch I landed, he hit me with his sword, and seeing how it does damage over time, I had to make sure to keep myself healed up. I was able to cripple him rather easily, which of course did help quite a bit with the fight. We had a sort of back and forth thing going on for about 3 minutes until I landed one clean punch that just sent him right down. Now while you could make the argument that I wasn't fighting fair because I had healing supplies, I would like to point out that one of his soldiers completely blindsided me despite the fact this was meant to be a one on one fight. After I dealt with that random legion soldier I went back to Lanius and just kept hitting him with the punches and bunches until he finally died and his limbs fell off. With the main thread out of the way I went to give the NCR their terms of surrender, but they didn't seem all too happy about that, so rather than talk them down I just did what I did best and started throwing hands. I managed to get a couple of good hits off on Oliver before he got minced by Mr. House. With that, I spoke to Mr. House, finishing the game and proving that yes, you can indeed beat Fallout New Vegas with only Boxing Tip. This challenge was a lot of fun to record. The Boxing Tip honestly wasn't as bad as I thought it would be, even though it did have the lowest fatigue damage when compared to the Boxing Gloves and the Golden Gloves. Regardless, that's going to the end of this challenge video. If you enjoyed what you saw, consider giving the video a like, and if you're interested in more challenges in the future, feel free to subscribe as I try to have one of these videos out every week. My name's Nervid, stay safe everyone, and I'll see you all in the next video.